Hello everyone, my name is Christina. I'm here today again with my friend Emily for episode three of our mini series. Uh, last time we were talking about neuroplasticity and placebo and how thoughts become reality. I'm um, really going into a little bit of a scientific basis to how those things occur in the first place. And What's interesting is that we can be doing all these amazing things for ourselves. We can meditate, um, we can eat right, but there's just something about laying the basic foundations um, within how we live our life. And one of those foundations is obviously quality sleep. So I'm bringing Emily again to kind of shed the light on the importance of quality sleep and also to, dis to discuss some other topics within that realm as well. Um, so Emily, as per usual, um, I'm going to just hand it to you to start us off on these topics and, and really explain a little bit deeper for our audience, um, sleep patterns, circadian rhythms, uh, why the quality of sleep is so important for our function, optimal function, um, et cetera. So, Take it away. Thank you very much for having me. It's always fun to do these interviews with you. Um, so for those who are meeting me for the first time, uh, my name is Emily and I come from a medical slash public health background. And my focus has been, a lot of my focus has been on how does health function in relation to other things in our environment? So not only looking at our body physiologically, but how does our environment influence it? And how does that two-way street work? Because our environment kind of informs us and how healthy we are, but also we um, and how we function and relate to other people is it gets affected in our environment. And so today we decided that sleep was a really important topic because it is usually underestimated it's in, with its importance. I think most people, as I did too in the very beginning, think sleep that is just a time to just shut down, shut off your computer and recharge so that you have energy the next day. And that's about all it is. And as long as we were getting enough hours of sleep that we would be perfectly recharged and that's all it took. Now there's a lot of myths to dispel in all that and there's much more to sleep. In that, it's not only the length of time you're sleeping but the quality at which you're sleeping during that time. So that explains why some people, if they're getting really quality sleep, can only sleep six hours and it's fine and somebody else sleeps 12 hours and they're still groggy and tired. So today we're gonna go into dispelling some of the myths about sleep, giving you a quick, easy background into what it is, why it's much more important than we think it is, and what are some hacks and what are some quick fixes that you can do at home and in your lifestyle in order to improve your sleep because it affects everything, every aspect of our function. Um, yeah, how much time do we first spend thing? in our life sleeping? Is it like a third of our life, right? Something like that? Something crazy, but most of it is not uh, quality. Exactly. I think that is the issue. And there are a lot of invisible things that are affecting it that isn't necessarily de dealing, not always your fault or your makeup or your genetic makeup that's making it like that. Um, it's a mystery to a lot of people. So yeah, we spend a lot of time sleeping, but how much of that time is spent in good sleep? So today, the quick overview is, we're gonna do a quick sleep 101, tell you a little bit about the sleep hierarchy, which is basically the list of what are the most important things for you need to, to be healthy. Sleep is actually at the foundational level of that. It trumps or comes before the nutrition, supplements, exercise, if you don't have sleep as a baseline, those things are not going to really function well or help you no matter how much you do it. And then we're gonna go into some of the common sleep disorders because I think when people hear sleep disorders, they think, oh, I don't have a sleep problem. You know, I don't have restless leg syndrome. I don't have sleep apnea, but it's more common than you think. And it can be even snoring that indicates to you that your sleep is being disrupted at some level. It can be the fact that you're a mouth breather that indicates that your sleep isn't really optimal. So it's to dispel that. And then we will go into um, different parts like the circadian rhythms, how does that affect it, uh, nutrition, diet, exercise, 
Uh, also hormones. I think there's a lot there that people aren't aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the food and gut sleep connection too. How does your gut and the condition it then affect how well you sleep? So we're going to pick at those layers one by one. So um, important. So just, those. yeah, of course. So I mentioned a moment ago, the sleep, the health hierarchy. And what the health hierarchy is, is all the components, if you think about a pie, a pie chart, all of the little pie slices that make up and work together, what constitutes a healthy lifestyle in your optimal health. And that's nutrition and diet, that is exercise, that is your hormone balance, that is your sleep schedule. Um, It's your mindset, it's your stress levels. Preceding all of those things, first comes sleep. If your body can't detoxify and recharge fully, you can't exercise or build muscle effectively. You can't uh, produce the right quantity of hormones to make your metabolism you know, work at, at the right pace that it needs to. Um, that leads to things like weight gain, that leads to things like diabetes. If you are not sleeping, no matter how good much nutrition you take in, no matter how good your diet is, your body's not gonna be able to process that. So it's like putting really good gas into a halfway broke down car, right? So that car can't use it. So sleep trumps all these things because it filters out all the kind of extra toxins and extra information in your brain that you've accumulated throughout the day. Mm. So this is just to emphasize why sleep is so important and you know what triggers it to be to be better and that could be light exposure during the day how much you stay awake and how much sunlight you get um the light exposure that you're getting at night are you exposing yourself to light at night when your body needs to shut down so we're going to start basically with the um reset button and sleep and how it cleans out your brain that's one aspect of it Um, we process a lot of imagery throughout the day. You see a lot of things that sometimes you're not conscious of. Maybe the billboard that you saw as you were driving by it on the highway. It could have been a random TV commercial. It could have been just a squirrel running by. There's a reason that we don't remember those things the next day necessarily or the next week because your brain decided that wasn't really important to me in order to function. And your brain starts separating what is important for me to remember Maybe something like um, you almost had an accident and it scared you. Your brain's like, I'm going to remember that because I need to remember this and hold on to it to prevent this person from getting into another accident again so that they can be careful. So it'll hold on to that and then it'll get rid of other things such as maybe a random bird you saw or a random squirrel or an ad you didn't need to see. So if your brain doesn't do that well, Think about it, you get a whole library of information with a lot of junk mail in it. And if you don't clean out that inbox, it starts getting a traffic jam a little bit. And you can't, now you can't prioritize what's important and what's necessary and what's not. So sleeping actually helps you do that. So when we say detoxify the brain, it's not only of the toxins that float through the blood vessels that go through your brain, but it's also separating out what is the junk mail and the spam mail from the important priority now. Mm. Um, Working downwards uh, in your immune system and your organs, especially during a time now where we are having exposure to a lot of new viruses and different strains of those viruses, your immune system is really important. And your immune system, I like to think of it as um, you have blood vessels running through every part of your body. Your immune system and your lymph system are also a system of vessels that run alongside your blood vessels. And your blood vessels, as it kind of spits out through its permeable walls, as it kind of spits out all the stuff and the dirty things it doesn't need, your immune system picks it up, kind of like a, like a trash truck that's r- riding around and collecting trash from all the houses down the street. If that trash truck is overwhelmed, or if the road lymph system that that trash truck is riding along has a traffic jam. It can't get to the points of your lymph nodes, which is where a lot of the dumping happens. 
these points and junctions where all the system of lymphs come together and dump mm -hmm. and then excrete it out of your system through your, you know, your bladders and through your feces, through um, liver. So that's blocked up. And during sleep is when all of that happens. And if you don't stay in your sleep deep enough, if you're not getting quality sleep, that trash truck and all of its duties can't be executed. They can't be carried out. So you wake up now in your environment again, accumulating more toxins, but you haven't finished cleaning out your system because you didn't stay asleep long enough or your sleep quality wasn't good. So in that sense too, you're number two, your brain is affected. And number two, your immune system is affected. Number three, well, your organs, your liver, they all need to reset and it's wear and tear. As we get older, it gets used and new old cells die, new ones are being repaired. In order for those new cells to be repaired, your body sends signals via hormones, like growth hormones, to go to that area and start building new cells. If those new cells aren't built because your sleep is bad, because because during sleep, it does the hormone regulation as well, and we'll cover that in a moment. Mm -hmm. If your cells aren't being built and those organs can't function optimally because now they're kind of have kind of I'm simplifying it a lot, but let's say they have broken parts or broken pieces and they're not whole and they're not rebuilding and rejuvenating. Uh, you can't function without that. You can't detoxify without liver and alcohol and diet and, and your quality of sleep all have a symphonic um, synchronous role in all of that. Yeah. So we talked about organs. Next, we talked about, we already touched on hormones. Hormones are something much more beyond your sex hormones, like testosterone and estrogen and the female menstrual cycle. Um, it's also something beyond just the phase that adolescents go through with their hormones changing. They are control messages that your brain sends to the destination organ to say, to do whatever it needs to do. Like, hey, I need you to repair. Or hey, I need you to start working. Or hey, I need you to amp up or slow down. So or I need you to wake most, up. Yeah, I need you to wake up. I need you to go to sleep. And that's like, so hormones are much more than these discrete phases that we usually hear a lot in the media about like, oh, you know, um, men have testosterone and women have estrogen and it changes during the menstrual cycle or only adolescents get it. No, they're constantly functioning. And if that communication isn't there, if the flux of hormones isn't in balance, so it's not about having a lot of good hormones and having a lot of bad, low, bad hormones. There's no good and bad. It's just, are those things at equilibrium? And I want you to think of it in a seesaw way. If I'm standing in the center of a seesaw on that fulcrum in the middle, and it starts tilting to one side, I'm going to lose my balance eventually and fall over. If it starts tilting to the other side, I'm also going to lose my balance. It's only when I'm centered can I feel stable and feeling like I, I have, I'm anchored and good enough to do functioning or whatever it is I'm doing standing on there. And your body is the same. And the reason I'm giving you guys this visual is because we touched on neuroplasticity, visualization, meditation and the placebo effect. And a lot of that employs visualizing your body so that you can heal or so that whatever it is you need to do. So I like to give these visual examples so that you have something to reference again when you go back and do those so that you understand your body because we're talking a lot in this conversation about things that you cannot always see so easily without you know machinery and scannings and, and things like that. So in order to connect better, I just think it's important to have a visual strategy for that, or at least kind of get a sense of what it might look like so that I can kind of tap into it a little better. So going back to hormones, it's not about bad and good. There's none of that. In the body, the only objective your body has is to keep you at equilibrium because equilibrium equals optimal functioning. And optimal functioning means that survival. And, and survival means, well, that's, the only reason your body is uh, the only objective your body has to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. 
So there's hormone for growth and repair, melatonin, sleeping, serotonin, the happy hormone, testosterone, all those things. And then lastly, it comes to your gut. Um, there's different areas of your gut that your sleep will affect. Uh, and we often talk about the gut brain being the second brain. Mm-hmm. And it's because, and I challenge you guys to think about it. When you're about to have a presentation or when you're about to go on a date or meet somebody new, um, you're thinking and perceiving these things with your head. But where do you feel them? Where do you feel the butterflies? It's in your stomach, right? And that just goes to tell you there's a very strong connection between what's up here and what's in here. And if here is not good, it's a two-way street. So if, if your gut isn't good and functioning optimally um, because you're not digesting food well, you're not eating the right diet, your blood sugar is all, levels are all over the place, it will ultimately have a focus, uh, an effect on your brain. And then it becomes a, a self-feeding cycle. Then your brain can't function and signal the rest of your body. Then the rest of your body goes out of whack. And then you feel like depressed or you get mood disorders or you get cranky. We all know that when we don't sleep well or we haven't eaten, um, we all get cranky. And that's because basically you're not resting or your blood sugar levels are out of whack. Those things all have to deal with the gut. So indirectly. Yeah. One of my, uh, one of my potential clients, we had a a call the other day and um, it's a, it's a woman who had um, surgery done on, on her face and it didn't go as well as she planned um, or she Mm -hmm. hoped for. And this situation has uh, caused a big disruption in her sleep patterns, which in turn causes um, major anxiety for her. And so uh, since the surgery, she hasn't been able to have that restful sleep, has been sleeping for maybe three, four hours at best, and that's not quality sleep, and then would always wake up with this feeling of anxiety and dread. And so, yes, that's like the relationship between hormones and how our brain operates and ultimately how our emotions are involved as well. So quality sleep is so uh, multifaceted because it encompasses all other aspects of our being, right? Yeah. Um, And I bet you, even if we were your patient or your patient herself, like, I don't think we would have connected it to sleep necessarily, right? Or thought it would affect that area too. Like, okay, there's a surgery and yeah, maybe I'm still anxious of it because I'm still recovering, but you would have never known that sleep was involved in that equation. And that's kind of, I think, why it's important for us to sit here today and demystify some of that because there's a lot of things going on behind the curtain than what you can see happening on stage, right? And she's lost 10 pounds as well, not wanting to lose weight, but that's just a byproduct of not resting well enough, not having a healthy appetite in turn, et cetera. So all these biological processes that you mentioned are connected, right? So the cliche, everything is connected. It really is. Everything is connected, right? Absolutely. And that's something, what happened to your client and the effects of having now losing her appetite and now having less of a calorie intake that caused her to lose weight. We will, in the future of this talk, go into why actually low calorie um, will disrupt your sleep. Mm. And it's quite interesting. It's quite fascinating. They all come from this evolutionary thing. And so that's something we'll talk on, talk about. I mean, if it's of interest. Yeah, definitely. Tell me, tell me a little bit about circadian rhythm I'm, I'm sure people have heard about uh the phrase circadian rhythm um we use it in chinese medicine as well um so when we look at the organ function um basically each of the organs has a specific time during the day where the energy of the organ is at its strongest or at its weakest so in those um, late hours, like the hours between 12 and 3 a.m. So 1 to 3 a.m. is actually liver time. Um, And it's always interesting to me when I ask my clients, 
hey, what is the time of the of, of the night when you wake up usually, whether that's to go to the bathroom and urinate or to grab a snack or for whatever reason, you know, it gives me more information about, hey, maybe I need to tap into this organ function um, to help yeah. them get that restful sleep so they're not kicking and, and screaming at night or having nightmares or, you know, just randomly waking up at different times. So can you tell us a little bit about that circadian rhythm stuff? So circadian rhythm is basically an internal clock that has a different time setting that says, ah, this person should be awake during this time and functioning and digesting. Um, and because it's her or his awake time, we need to be pumping a little bit more cortisol in the system, which is like the wake up hormone. Um, and then it'll be another time where, uh, and they're all triggered. The circadian rhythm doesn't function autonomously. It's mm -hmm. triggered by your environment. That's why when you go into a different time zone, you eventually adjust because the sunlight and what time that comes up or the time that the sun sets is kind of sending signals to your clock to adjust to that. So uh, reversely at night, circadian rhythm is kind of the thing that tells you, oh, okay, I can sense that the light, the blue light that's coming from the sun is now turning to red light, which is saying that I need to sleep or get ready to at least. And things are slowly starting to calm down a little bit. Um, and when you're sleeping, like you said, the different organs have optimal times. It's kind of like when you're going into a, uh, let's say like a mechanic shop and there's all these cars you have to fix and each car is a different one and is representing a different organ. You can't fix them all at once, right? There's an optimal time for each of them. And once there's a certain order to things. So um, your body might be fixing one at this time um, and the liver at another time, the brain at another time. So there are optimal levels. And the clock says when that is, and it, that all happens during sleep. And we'll go into why if you don't stay in your sleep long enough, you're not giving your body a chance to get to those organs mm -hmm. that come later in that sleep cycle. So for example, if my optimal liver cleansing time, I'm gonna make this up, is let's say 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I don't get to bed until like two, three o'clock a.m. in the morning. I need to, I need time to transition into, first of all, calming down, then falling asleep, then getting into the REM state, and then the deeper REM state in order for me to get to that point where my liver starts being detoxified. But if I miss that time window because I went to sleep so late and so close to the time window that that liver should have started detoxifying, I'm going to miss it. And that liver won't detoxify us completely. Mm. So that's the reason why listening to your circadian rhythm, and that's, if you look at animals in nature, they will always follow it. When it's winter, they will sleep more because it stays darker longer. Um, in the summer, they will sleep less. They will rise with the sun and they will go to sleep with the sunset. Mm. So it's, for a reason that these things have to be in sync and working. It's like you passing a baton to the next person. If you don't make it there in time, you're holding them up. And if you hold them up and then just stop the race before they even got to their, their, their run, finish their heat, then you're interrupting a process. Mm -hmm. So circadian rhythm is not just your internal clock and something that adjusts when you go through different time zones, but it's very sensitive to those triggers. And that's precisely why if you notice next time or tomorrow when you wake up, when you see the sunrise, it's a very bright white light. Mm. That's like the blue light that's simulated out on our electronic devices. If you look at the sunset that same day, it'll turn like a bright orange yellow. That's the red light mm -hmm. that people try to now incorporate as features into the electronic devices so that you can go to sleep. But if you're looking at your computer and you're looking at your device, you're triggering blue light that keeps you awake at a time when your body should start to slowly shut down. And that is why 
you can't sleep at night later, even after you close the device. You've already awakened and triggered certain hormones to keep you up. And that's why you might get tossing and turning as one of the reasons. So there's a study uh, that says that more than half of our genes are regulated by our circadian clock. Mm -hmm. That's to say, in addition, that even if our genes and our hormones are re regulated by these, by these signals that are coming from our external environment, that the genes that we're born with aren't necessarily fixed. That environment, it's nurture over nature in this sense. Mm. So because if you think about it, it makes complete sense in evolution. Because the human body is, we as animals are made to adapt because adapting means survival. Of course, it's going to adapt to the environment. Right. And our environment is full of electronics. Our environment is full of like different things that our bodies are now working to adapt to and having some growing pains in doing so. Um, you know, they didn't have this diet hundreds of years ago. They didn't have these electronics hundreds of years ago. They didn't have so many artificial things that were triggering mm -hmm. us. So if more than half of our hormones and genes are all regulated by circadian rhythm, because that clock needs to be on point and honored, by us allowing ourselves to go to sleep when we should, not trying to stay up, not eating too late and disrupting the sleep process, mm -hmm. then that is ultimately, of course, going to affect everything from heart disease to diabetes to cancer because it will play out and manifest into those things because anything that is a dis-ease or a disorderly mm -hmm. thing will lead to those conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say that our circadian rhythms, we usually think of it in terms of sleeping, but sleeping well and our hormones and our circadian clocks are just as much of a day problem as it is a night problem. So here's myth one. We think, oh, you know, sleeping is just about what I do at night. No, how much light exposure you get during the day will determine how much melatonin or the sleep hormone that you produce at night. So not getting enough light during the day will actually, I mean, if you get a little bit of light during the day, then you're just going to produce, because the body wants to stay in equilibrium, a little bit of melatonin at night. And this might not be enough to keep you in deep sleep. Mm -hmm. If I get a lot of stimulation during the day, like too much, right? It might be hard for me to find a way to calm down because I'm, I'm gonna try to produce like, this is going to offset the amount of uh, melatonin that I need to sleep. Mm -hmm. So the point here is, regardless of what the extremes are, they need to be in equilibrium. And that's what explains, this is maybe you have been in a situation where you didn't go outside all day and you laid in bed all day and you can't sleep at night. It's not just because you got tons of rest. No, mm -hmm. it's because you didn't get any light exposure in order to produce the opposite of of the light exposure, which is melatonin. Right. Um, and vitamin D so, plays a huge role in that. That's why the sure. sun exposure is so important Absolutely. because ultimately, you know, it 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 is a it related to the production of, of melatonin, right? Of course. Um, Absolutely. And I would like to say that just because you're wearing eye covers at night, it doesn't mean that your body can't detect light. So if you guys have electronic alarm clocks or a nightlight, mm, the phone, maybe even if it's on silent, let's say it lights up when you do get a message in the middle of the night, your body will still detect that even if your eyes don't. Mm -hmm. So they did an experiment where they covered somebody up completely with an eye mask and covers, and they just shined a small little light at the toe of the person and they produce significantly less sleep hormone, meaning their sleep was disrupted because the body detected that there was light on and stayed partially awake because of it. So those sensors are throughout your entire body, not just through your eyes. So one advice that you could tell our audience who may be struggling with these types of things, especially 
let's say you have a computer in your in your bedroom or other electronics, mm -hmm. would you suggest that people disconnect them from um, electricity from from the plugs? Um, that's better than just shutting it off. Would you say that's that's correct? Um, I would say that doing the most you can doesn't hurt in this case because, and I will tell you why, putting, if you are sleeping, first of all, the optimal condition is to not even sleep in a room that has electronic devices on. If you have a TV in your bedroom, okay, of course, you're not going to move the TV out every time. So I would turn those things off and completely. So what I mean by instead of putting that TV or computer on sleep mode, I would turn it off completely. If it's a computer like a laptop and it can be easily taken out of the room or your cell phone as well, I would just move it out of the room altogether mm -hmm. because those things might not might be shut down. But if they're plugged into a wall, there is an electricity circuit that's still humming and going through those cables that are in the wall that's near wherever your body might be. And your body is all secretly picking on, up on that. Mm -hmm. So one woman wasn't sleeping well in a study and she, they had figured out that the reason she wasn't sleeping well, she had turned off all of her devices and everything like that. She had even gone to unplug things from her room or mm -hmm. did the majority of the charging in another room or a completely separate area of the house. But she still wasn't sleeping. And they later found out that on the outside of her house, on the same wall that was, that her head would be near when she was like, would be lying in her bed, there was an electronic meter that the one that's being constantly turning and like being read in some of the older houses. So all of the electricity that's passing and surging through that house is being read by this big machine that's sitting on the out external layer of that wall of where her head is. So she actually reoriented her, her bed to a different part of the wall, or I, she, could, you, she could have slept in another room, and her quality of sleep changed because her brain wasn't picking up on all of those invisible uh, surges of electricity. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these things are really invisible. And so what I would suggest is, yes, the best thing is to sleep in a room where you don't have many things plugged into the wall, um, unplug it if you can. So there's not even this uh, default level of e electricity running through because that device has to always kind of be on a semi-sleep mode so that when you turn the switch on, it can respond. But right. unplug it completely so it has no response. And um, I would say, yeah, take, take the things that you can control out of your room, any source of light, electricity, um, things plugged into the wall, power switches, yeah. those all your body is picking up. And then just to reiterate, um, because you mentioned about the differences between the blue and the red light, which I think is very important for people to understand. Um, and you said that there is a light obviously emanating from the electronics. So let's say someone has a habit of maybe watching Netflix or, you know, people, a lot of people I know kind of um, put themselves to sleep by watching TV or watching things on their laptops and computers. So I know that um, more modern um, pieces of equipment now have something where you can adjust the type of light that's emanating from those devices, uh, but also um, certain things like um, I have a pair of blue um, light blocking glasses that I use especially if I need to use my computer um, past 8 p.m. I really try not to these days, but it, it happens. It's, it's a habit, right? Um, so yeah. can you tell our audience a little bit about that, um, right? What are, what, what, what are maybe optimal times to say, okay, let me unplug. Is it two, three hours before going to sleep um, in your research and experience? Um, what can you tell us about that? So when, when it comes to a standard rule about these things, I hesitate to give one, um, one solid answer about it because every human body and the level of sensitivity of each of us is very different. For example, I'm very sensitive. So I know that if I watch 
Netflix or work on my computer. And for probably two hours, I can't fall asleep or I, I will have trouble sleeping throughout the night. It'll just be, it, will, it won't be deep. Mm. Um, so I know that I absorb those things very well. Other people might not. I like to think of it this way. When you eat food and you ingest something, with the case of electricity, it's you're ingesting that light. In the case of food, it's ingesting the, whatever meal you had. It needs time to work through your system. It needs time to digest and then eventually filter out. So you might have different sensitivity levels, but I always try to follow the rule of like, I don't do electronics maybe two hours before bed mm -hmm. and always do other things that are conducive to calming me down to get to that sleep ready state a lot faster. So that could be a little bit of stretching. I might do foam rolling. Um, I might listen to like music or try to meditate. Mm -hmm. And people who meditate will notice that when they get deep into it, they fall asleep like that. So true. And so um, there's no hard, fast rule for hours, but I would say that you can think of it this way. If the sun sets around, let's say these days, like in the summer, let's say around seven, eight o'clock, then I would start getting ready at least you don't have to exactly follow the sun but i would start getting ready to turn off those devices along with the sun because it's like another sun right it's a source of light um and i know our lifestyles aren't conducive to doing that perfectly but how close can you get it so that doing something is better than nothing is always the rule that i try to follow and there are other things that you can adjust as well so it's not only just following that hard fast rule, turn everything off by like 7 p.m. or anything. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work for you, if you absolutely can't, because you know, maybe you have to work until nine, I don't know. Um, try other things though. Try mm -hmm. when you do shut it off, do some meditation so you can get to that sleep ready state faster mm -hmm. um, and counter the effects of everything you've just ingested from staying up with that light. Move your bed away from any kind of plugs or outlets. So it's, we're giving here you a whole spectrum of things you can do and you can pick and choose what works for your lifestyle and see what your body responds to. So you're not left with a kind of black or white option, like all or nothing. So, yeah. And um, I also wanted to just go back to um, something that you said about the gut health, right? And the importance of that gut brain connection. Can you delve a little bit deeper into that? Um, as well? Sure. I'll start by um, asking everyone to think about a time when they maybe made, ate a very heavy meal and they couldn't really fall asleep at night because you just kind of feel so full. Uh, it's not just feeling full that's uncomfortable and that's why you can't fall asleep. It's the fact that like your body's on full speed trying to digest and break down all this food. Right. And because it's up and running and turning its gears, well, it should be doing the opposite at that time and it's not. So now it's delaying your sleep because it needs to wake up and do that. Or um, if, you, if you drink alcohol, perhaps drinking alcohol could make you snore or toss and turn. Mm. Um, or the fact that maybe your meals aren't balanced and then over time you just can't sleep very well at all or you're not eating enough calories. Right. And that's why you're not sleeping. So your gut and what you put into it and how much you put into it and the quality of what you put into it is really going to take an effect on how you sleep. And if your sleep gets affected by that, it's going to, again, go into the same self-feeding cycle of now your, your body's not going to function optimally. So your digestion isn't great. So the next time you eat, it's not going to digest so well. And you're not going to sleep that well again. And then it's going to go on and on and on. And um, I will give you an example for what happens when alcohol is consumed in your sleep and how that is affecting your sleep on a more, you know, biological level. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is a bit of a relaxer. And when you're sleeping, the muscles in your throat that are keeping your airways open shrink down to the size of almost a straw. They collapse because everything is now relaxing in your body, right? And they just keep it open the bare minimum so that you can optimally breathe 
and keep the pH levels balanced with the oxygen you're taking in and the carbon dioxide you're putting out, mm -hmm. right? When you drink alcohol, it's even more of a relaxer. So it's already doing more of what that body is naturally going to do. So now you're feeling like more of a collapse. And now that straw is a smaller size than what at minimum it should be. And you can't breathe well. So all of a sudden, let's say you're nose breathing and we'll cover this. Nose breathing is more optimal than mouth breathing and we'll explain why. But let's say I'm doing fine. I'm just no nose breathing normally. But after drinking, these airways back here that's connected to my nose start to collapse just a little bit. Well, my body's gonna start getting desperate for air. So when you're running really fast and you're breathing through your nose and all of a sudden your chest is pumping and you're out of air, what starts happening? You start breathing through your mouth because you can take a bigger amount in. So your mouth now starts to open to compensate for the air that's not coming through that should be your passageways and you start mouth breathing. So mouth breathing is fine as a default, but over time, if you continue to mouth breathe, what happens is the quality of air that's going in, that the quality of air is the same going through your nose and your mouth. The mouth and the nose convert it in different ways. There's different pH levels. Mm -hmm. And those pH levels aren't at balance when you take it in through your mouth. With your nose, it is. So when you mouth breathe over time, you could also get um, acid reflux because now acidity is building up in your body. Mm. You could just get like just regular dry throat. Those are physical symptoms, but your body is now trying to compensate for this collapse that the alcohol has, has caused. And mm. now you can't sleep well because now you're breathing through your mouth and now your pH systems are out of whack. Yeah. And if they're out of whack, they can't do all the detoxification, detoxification that it needs. So that's what we mean by saying like what you eat, when you eat it and drinking have all these effects indirectly that you wouldn't have thought. And that is not even getting to the gut. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the gut yet, but when your gut is not absorbing the nutrients because your diet isn't healthy now, your body is working harder or going to make you hungrier because Let's say out of a plate I food, of food I got, my gut wasn't in good condition or that food wasn't quality. So let's say I was only getting, if I was eating a really good quality meal, I could get 100% nutrient out of it. I'm eating kind of a less quality meal. Let's say it only gives me 50% of the nutrients I need. Your body's going to tell you to eat more and be hungrier because you're not absorbing everything you can out of that. Mm -hmm. And it needs to fill 100% to function. So it's going to make you eat more. And, and as a byproduct, you're consuming more calories. And that's when weight gain happens. That's why when you're not eating quality foods, um, sometimes you're not satiated because your body's not getting all the nutrients it needs. It makes you eat more. And with that comes more calories. And with more calories comes weight gain. Mm. So your gut is now keeping you awake because it's saying, I need more nutrients. I need you to stay up and eat. And in survival, again, that makes sense because the need to stay alive and nourished is stronger than the need to rest. And that is precisely why if you're under eating the number of calories that you need or you had a big workout that day and burned a lot more and didn't eat enough, mm. your body doesn't let you sleep because of that because it's going into a survival mode of like you stay up and you eat more because you need that to keep yourself alive, not rest. Rest comes secondary. Um, that's a and really that's good explanation. Got... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Really good, really good um, all around description of different processes that are going on simultaneously within our bodies um, and how that really affects the quality of sleep. Um, I want to end here, but this topic is so much more extensive and I want to give the audience a chance to also um, kind of go on a journey with us further with these because um, there's so much more that I would love to talk about, especially when we get into the sleep, uh, 
you know, sleep patterns and dreams, which we touched upon a little bit even in our previous episodes. Um, these are really, really important topics to cover. And um, because a lot of people tell me that they don't remember their dreams, um, they think that they don't dream. Um, and there's so much that goes on during that dream state, right? And I think yes. you mentioned it briefly last time when we talked. So I kind of want to guide you in that direction just to give our audience a little sneak peek of that dream state, right? You mentioned REM sleep and um, how memory really gets converted during those deep moments of sleep. Um, mm -hmm. So we can segue then into our next episode um, when we talk a little bit more about those topics. Yes, um, I think in our following episodes, what will be covered for everyone who's interested is more going a little bit more into depth of like, well, now that I've learned all these things about my sleep and we will be learning more, um, what can I do? What are the small fixes that I can make in my diet, in my exercise patterns, in the timing of those things, in the timing of those meals and even the electronic stimulation? But on top of that, when I actually do get into a good sleep, what is going on? We touched upon it by saying we touched on detoxification. We touched upon, upon like integrating things into our memory. But you specifically, what you mentioned about REM sleep, the reason it's so important is because your, your sleep window has a lot of different phases. In the beginning, it's just you falling asleep. Then you get deeper and deeper and deeper into REM. And then the and now even the REM is broken down into subcategories of phases. Mm. So initially when you go into REM and you're deep enough, you will start dreaming. Most people, every, usually everyone will dream. And if you can stay in that REM stage long enough, your dreams and everything else that you process that day goes and starts getting archived from short-term memory into long-term memory. Now, most people don't stay in REM long enough or deep enough to get to that part, mm -hmm. which is why they start getting, you know, like, oh man, I can't remember what I did yesterday, or I can't remember. I think I had a dream, but I can't remember any of it. You most likely did, just didn't stay in the REM long enough or deep enough to remember it. So mm -hmm. as an indicator that you've gotten a good amount of sleep is usually when you have a dream and you can wake up and remember it. Because wow. that means that all the stuff went into long-term so that you can wake up and say, oh, I had it. Um, that is an indicator usually for me that I have reached an, the deepest level of sleep I can using my dream as a marker or the fact that I can recall the dream as a marker to indicate to me that like, okay, my body need, did everything that it needed to do because it was successfully able to fall to that level of profundity of sleep. And a lot of things get processed there. Um, and if that isn't reached often or frequently enough, then that will start causing mood issues and crankiness and mood disorders, like everyday things like depression. It's not always because something's wrong or imbalanced with you, but it's because maybe you're not sleeping. So yeah, the topic of dream is super interesting because it is used kind of as a marker to tell you, am I, am I sleeping right? Am I sleeping enough? Am I sleeping deeply enough? Yeah, is it quality? I think it's one of the biggest misconceptions, is, at least from the people that I've talked to. It's like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. When you dream, that's not, that's not quality sleep, right? So I, I can't wait to talk more about that and um, definitely from your perspective. And so Emily is um, teaching some workshops about sleep um, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to kind of bring that to the forefront and you guys can reach out to her um, for, for more information about that coming in the future. But um, wrapping up this conversation today and thanking you for spending the time with me um, to talk about these important topics and uh, just to bring awareness to the audience at large um, and definitely speaking about it in layman terms, but also presenting the scientific basis for it. So thank you again for your time and uh, we'll see you next time.
Thank you for having me.